Good morning, Grace Warman. Welcome here. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here, along with Clay and Jared. And if you've been with us for the past while, you might already know we have been going through uh, the book of Luke lately. And we go through scripture uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse most often. And we do this for a few reasons. First of all, it's great for helping us to understand scripture within the larger story that the author is laying out, which is super important so that the meaning of the text that we're going through is better understood within the context that the author has put it into. We can't just pluck out a verse and attach our own emphasis to it. Also, as we go through the text, it doesn't allow us as pastors uh, to just preach what we like best or to ride our hobby horses, so to speak. It doesn't allow us to just skip over controversial subjects or difficult texts that we would rather not touch, uh, kind of like the one we might find ourselves in today. And so, with all that said, we are in the book of Luke, as I mentioned, we're in chapter 4, and we're going to be taking verses 31 to 44 today. So if you have a, a paper copy of the Bible with you, you will find the book of Luke quite close to the end of the, uh, the Bible, uh, the book version. If you have an app version, you should be able to just look it up using the search function. Again, we're in Luke chapter 4, and we'll be taking verses 31 to 44. And the entire passage is going to be read out on the screen behind me, and then we're going to pray together uh, before we dig into this text. Reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 44. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we are thankful that you have given us your word once again to go through today. And uh, we're also asking for a, just an extra special measure of grace today as we go through this text. There are some heavy things in these verses, and so we just pray that you would help us to to navigate them well today. I pray that these stories that Luke lays out for us in his gospel account of who you are and what you did, I just pray that they would just renew our love and our admiration for you and our worship of you and to really help us find our, our rest and our, our trust in you. Thank you for giving us um, this insight into your power and, and your authority this morning so that our faith might grow in strength. And so that we can just rest in knowing that the one who has all authority in heaven and earth has us in his hands and protects us as his children if we have faith in him. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so just to uh, catch you up to the story a little bit, Clay did a great job 
uh, last week of just bringing us through the story of Jesus teaching in his hometown of Nazareth in the synagogue there from the scroll of Isaiah, which we find in our Old Testament scriptures today. And so it would have been sort of like uh, what we do on a Sunday morning. Like Clay said, we read through scripture and we teach the meaning of it. And so we see this in verses 15 and 16 from last week that it was uh, the habit of Jesus to go into the synagogues where he was and to teach as he traveled about the region. And once again, in today's text, we see that Jesus was teaching on the Sabbath, uh, Saturday, in another uh, city in the region of Galilee, this time in the city of Capernaum. Now, Unlike last week, where Luke gave us the details of what Jesus was teaching, this week's passage um, that we're going to go through doesn't share what he taught, but rather it gives us the story of what happened while he taught. And so let's dig into our text this morning, verses 31 and 32. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. So on the Sabbath... Jesus goes into this synagogue once again. uh, Verses 33 and 38 show us that he was in the synagogue, and he teaches. And as he's teaching, everyone is just astonished at his teaching. We don't know what he was teaching, but regardless, he had their attention. And they probably had not heard someone teach quite like this before. And it doesn't tell us anything about really how he taught, other than that he taught with authority. There was something about him in his humanness at the time that when he spoke, you listened. I don't know if you've ever met someone who's like this, but I have met people uh, who are in authority, I guess, and sometimes in different circumstances. Uh, And not everyone's going to seem authoritative all the time. It often depends on the surrounding circumstances, but the authoritative one is the one who has the most experience, the most knowledge, the most confidence to speak up, to lead, and to teach others within the context of a certain setting. For instance, like when a surgeon walks into the operating theater, they take charge. They know what to do. They have intimate knowledge of of the human body. They know how to get the work uh, done that needs to be done on the one who's about to be operated on. They know how to direct and teach those who are in the room to do their jobs properly. They direct the nurses, and the nurses listen. They they teach the medical students, and the medical students listen. Uh, the, The surgeon isn't questioned about his decisions. The only time you might get a question is if someone doesn't understand their instructions. And so... The surgeon has the authority in the room because he has the most knowledge, the most experience, and the, and the approval from the College of Surgeons and Physicians um, to take that authority and to instruct others and to expect the actions of the others to be based on his instructions. And so if you were to ask him a question about the surgery, uh, the surgeon probably wouldn't need to look up the answer in a book. They would already know the answer because it's so ingrained in them, it has become part of who they are. And this is how I imagine the authority of Jesus seemed to the hearers. As he was teaching, he didn't need to look up the answers to the questions. He knew everything. He knew his father. He knew the scriptures perfectly without even having to look it up. He didn't need to hum or haw or really have to try and think and formulate his answers like I would have to do. He just knew it. And and he had been sent to this world by his father for a purpose, and that was to teach and to preach the good news of the gospel. And so later on in our text, in verse 43, as he's speaking to a a different crowd, we see that this preaching of the good news of God's kingdom was the very purpose for which he was sent on this mission to earth. And verse 43 says this, he says, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of, of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So that was his purpose. And so the sense of authority that radiated from Jesus it came from his vast knowledge, his understanding, his, his confidence, which also came from his intimate knowledge of, of God's kingdom, but it was also given to him from the one who sent him. Just like a surgeon is given authority from his regulatory body, so Jesus was given authority from his regulatory body, God the Father. And so as Jesus is teaching, uh, everyone is just drawn in by his vast knowledge and confidence or, or authority by which he teaches And as he's teaching, there's this man who is possessed by a demon, verse 33. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice. Now, this is where the story gets weird for us. Now, probably not only for us as we read it, but more than likely, this would have been very awkward for those who were in attendance there. You can imagine 
what it might have been like to be sitting there being taught by Jesus, this one who seems to have this amazing authority and knowledge, and all of a sudden, a man cries out, not speaking of his own will, or out of his own will, but under the control of a demon. Now, maybe for most of us, our, our culture has probably shaped our view of what a, a, a demon actually is. There, there's movies and TV shows that have depicted demons or um, people who have been possessed by demons and exorcisms and all those types of things. And so we have this certain view of, uh, from really the world around us, I guess, of what it is like to be possessed by a demon or what a demon is like. And so we have this idea of what it's like to perform uh, maybe an exorcism. And, and often we have been shown that you have to say certain types of words or pray certain types of things or do certain ceremonial or ritualistic things just to get rid of these demons out of your life. Or, or maybe you're one who is different and really rejects uh, the world's picture of what a demon is and what a demon possession looks like. And you don't know what you believe about them or even if they, you believe they exist at all. To some of you, they might just seem like fictional creatures. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of details about who these demons are. And the truth is, they're not the point of this text or the point of the Bible. Otherwise, we would have been given much more information about them. But the Bible's about Jesus and his good news for humanity. But I feel like I need to go down this short rabbit trail to address some of the questions that I'm pretty sure are swirling around in your head right now just because of the strangeness of this demon possession. So we're going to go down this rabbit trail. Demons are basically just minions of Satan to do his bidding. And they are real. Scripture tells us just like angels are real. There is this spiritual realm that is closed off to us for the most part right now that we cannot see, that we cannot fully understand. But at times during the New Testament period when Jesus walked on this earth, there was this heightened awareness of this spiritual realm or, or you could say heightened spiritual activity that manifested itself in the physical world more often than it might have otherwise. And so it seemed as though this realm of angels and demons kind of intercepted with our, or intersected with our uh, physical realm more frequently than it did during the time of the Old Testament and during our period in history today. Now, there are times when that spiritual world does break through into our physical experience. It doesn't happen often, although it does seem that it happened most often when Jesus walked this earth, like when the angels proclaim the birth of Jesus, or here when a demon reveals himself to this group of people in the synagogue. And so we see in the New Testament that these demons had the ability at times to inhabit people and to control them. And this is where many of us get a little afraid and we worry that it could happen to us. And so before we go any further in the text, I would like to set uh, your mind um, at ease a little, maybe, I guess. If, if you're someone who believes in Jesus and has been saved by Jesus, and you have repented of your sin and put your faith in him, Jesus promised that he would fill us with his spirit when he ascended to heaven. And, and he fulfilled that promise at the day of Pentecost, shortly after his ascension when Peter was preaching. And so from then on, those who have been saved by Jesus are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they will bear the fruit of the Spirit as they live their lives. And if we're filled with the Spirit, we need not be worried about being filled or indwelled by something evil, by a demon. If we're filled with God, we cannot be filled with the devil. There's not room for both. These demonic spiritual beings, they can try to bother us as Christians or, or just tempt us or harass us. But ultimately, we have much more spiritual power in us, not of ourselves, but we have the Holy Spirit, God himself, in us. And, and we're about to see in this story what sort of authority that God has over these demons in just a moment, which is really the point of the text to begin with. It's about Jesus. It's not about demons. And Jesus was born as a man, but he was both fully man and fully God. And he had authority, even over these spiritual beings who try to harm us. So this should comfort us greatly. Our Savior, our King, our hero, he has no problem dealing with those who try to come against us from the spiritual realm, namely Satan and his demons. They have no power over Jesus. And as such, the children of Jesus are protected by him and his great power. So this is good news for us. And so we'll move on into the story, verses 34 and 36. 
the demon speaks, interrupting Jesus as he speaks. Verse 34, he says, Ha, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. So this demon, he cries out through the voice of this man, interrupting this teaching. He's like, ha, how unexpected. What are you doing here? Did you come to earth to destroy us? I know who you are. Now, I imagine this statement is a bit of mockery. It's like if we would see somebody who's rich and famous, say, like Prince Harry and Meghan Markle in Walmart. And we really didn't like them for how they treated the royal family and their responsibilities. And we see them in Walmart, and we yell out mockingly, like, like, huh, well, what are you doing here with us peasants? Like, I know who you are. You're, you're the prince. Did you lose all your privilege and your money and your status? Loser. Like, why are you here in Walmart? Did you get kicked out of the kingdom? Did you, ru- or, or did you come here to ruin Walmart for us too, just like you ruined the royal family? You know, so obviously this demon, he had kind of figured out exactly who this Jesus is and it almost seems like he wants to expose him as the son of God so that Satan and his demons can come and mock him and attack him and defeat him. He wasn't identifying Jesus as God's son or as the Holy One of God for Jesus' benefit or to spread the gospel. In fact, if the religious leaders had understood that Jesus was claiming to be God or God's son, they would likely accuse Jesus of blasphemy, as many of them did not recognize him as God. But it does seem like this particular um, demon was worried about what Jesus was doing here in this world. This world that had been under the dominion of Satan and his demons for so long, as we saw in the temptation of Jesus just a few weeks ago. And now, this demon is afraid of what Jesus is doing here, so he mocks him. What are you doing in our world? He knows who Jesus is, and he knows what Jesus plans to do, to defeat Satan and his demons, to destroy them. And so he cries out, hey, here's the one, the Holy One of God. I found him. Let's get him. And so I'm not sure if the demon underestimated the authority of Jesus or or what the thought process was, but not only did Jesus have authoritative teaching, he also had the ultimate authority and power over Satan and his demons. And so verse 35, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. So Jesus just rebukes the demon by his words and tells him, Be silent and come out. Now, the more literal translation would have been uh, more accurate in today's language as shut up and get out. That's what Jesus was saying. Upon hearing Jesus' command, The demon causes the man to convulse or be thrown down, and immediately he comes out of the man, causing him no harm. Such was the power and the authority of Jesus. He doesn't have to beg. He doesn't have to say it twice. He doesn't have to count to three. He doesn't have to say certain things or perform certain rituals or ceremonies. He says it, and the demon has to listen. There's no option. Jesus had authority whether that demon liked it or not. The spirit world that today is, I guess, somewhat or mostly, you could say, veiled to us, need not cause us to fear if we are God's children. Jesus has authority over it. If we are his children, we are safe in his arms. And he has said that he will lose none of his children, so we can take that to the bank. Jesus has the power to do what he says he will do. No one, not a circumstance or a person or a thing or a demon or Satan has power over Jesus. Jesus has the authority. Verses 36 and 37. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went into every place around, or every place in the surrounding region. So all those who were there experiencing Jesus' authoritative teaching, and then they experienced this surreal situation of Jesus showing his power over what appears to be this powerful spirit world, they're just amazed at the power 
and the authority that they had just witnessed coming out of this man. And the word started to spread of what Jesus could do, of his power and his authority. But Jesus wasn't done for the day. Even though it was the Sabbath, it was a day of mandatory rest for the Jewish people. Jesus, he leaves the synagogue and he heads over to Simon's house. Now, this Simon, he would later be called Peter. He is or what are, would be the disciple of Jesus. We don't actually know if Simon Peter was a disciple of Jesus at this point, as the different, gospels, uh, the different gospel accounts have the stories organized in different orders, and so they're not necessarily chronological. According to Luke here, if we take this account as chronological, it looks like Peter will only be called as a disciple later on in the chapter, whereas both Matthew and Mark have Peter being called as a disciple of Jesus before this story in Scripture. You know, it kind of looks like Luke has organized his story of the ministry of Jesus more geographically and Matthew more chronologically and Mark is a combination of the two. But either way, it makes no difference for this text. They all agree that they go from the synagogue to Peter's or Simon's mother-in-law's. And so she is sick with a high fever. And those around ask Jesus to heal her and by his mercy and his grace, he uses his power and his authority once again, this time to heal Simon Peter's mother-in-law. So not only does Jesus have authoritative teaching. Not only does he have power and authority over realms we can't see or understand, but he has power and authority over all sickness and disease, which are different from being possessed by a demon. Now, admittedly, sometimes in the New Testament, demon possession could look like sickness or disease, but they're not the same as we can see plainly in this text. Jesus stands over Simon's mother-in-law. He grabs her hand, rebukes the fever, and she gets up immediately and begins to serve her guests. Now, I don't know if you've gotten over a fever recently, but it usually takes a while to get back to normal even after, after the fever leaves. But not here. This was total and complete healing in an instant. With power and authority, everything must listen to Jesus, even sickness and disease. And it also might seem weird that Jesus would rebuke a fever by speaking to it, in a sense. But Jesus had the ability to use his power in whatever way he wished. He healed by speaking. He healed by touch. He made the blind see with spit and dirt. It just didn't matter. Jesus has authority. And whatever he willed, it happened. Continuing on in the day of Jesus, verses 40 and 41. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick, various diseases, brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the demons also came out of many crying. You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. So after Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law and the sun goes down on the Sabbath, many in Capernaum brought their sick friends and relatives to be healed. This is all happening on the Jewish Sabbath, which had strict requirements for rest, and so no carrying things over a certain weight or a certain distance, no, no walking too far. And so as soon as the sun sets, these people start bringing the sick to Jesus. And there were some with demons who Jesus cast out and he commanded them not to speak. And again, we're not completely sure why he commanded them not to speak. It says it's because they knew he was the Christ, but uh, we don't know why he didn't want people to know that. Maybe it could have been because they are agents or minions of the master of lies, Satan. And so even if demons were to tell the truth, some, some or many might think it's a lie or... We don't really know the reason, but regardless, Jesus doesn't want these demons to have any sort of verbal influence on the people around him. And all evening, Jesus is doing this work of healing and casting out demons, and nothing could stop him from that. And there was nothing he couldn't cure. Nothing had more power or authority over anyone or anything than Jesus did. And so this should give us great hope as children of God. During the ministry of Jesus, he proved that nothing had power over him. He raised people from the dead. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. So this is good news for us if we are his children. Now, some might have the temptation to think that if we are indeed a follower of Jesus, then Jesus should heal us from all our sickness and, and disease as well. And, and maybe this is what you're counting on. Maybe this is why you follow Jesus. You're counting on him for physical healing. The same thing happened to Jesus during the days of his ministry here on earth as well. Miraculously, he, he fed people and then they would follow him to get more food. And, or he healed some people and many others followed him to, to get healed from sickness and disease. But they didn't follow him for himself. 
All these miracles of healing and feeding and meeting people's physical needs, as great as they were, they served a purpose for Jesus, but they were never the point. They were designed to show the world the power and the might and the authority of Jesus, to show that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was the Messiah, and he was the one whom the prophets foretold, as we saw last week, as Jesus was teaching through the book of Isaiah, he was the one who came to set the people free to be their savior. He was the one who was sent by his father to pay for sin and to redeem his people. And the reality is that everyone who was healed or fed or had their needs met eventually either did either get sick and die or die some other way. The physical miracles, they were only temporary. And so if we take these scriptures and think that we also, we also ought to have miraculous healing from our ailments every time, then we misunderstand the meaning of the text. The healings and the miracles were for a purpose at that time. Now, today, God still heals people. He still works miracles. We believe it and we pray for it. But they're not ever guaranteed. And if he does perform miraculous healing, it's for his purpose, for his glory, for the building of his kingdom, because there will come a day when that physical healing does not happen. And we will exit this world and enter into the unveiled presence of God himself if we have repented of our sin and believe in Jesus for our salvation. This is why Jesus came to earth. Not so that we could have healing in this world as it is today, but he came to bring us ultimate restoration and healing in the world as it one day will be in his presence. New heavens, new earth, and a new body. So it's been a long day for Jesus here in this text. Teaching, casting out demons, healing the sick during what appears to be all night long, according to our text, verses 42 to 44, it says, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him. And they would have kept him from leaving them, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So the morning comes, after a night of healing, and Jesus leaves Capernaum to go to a desolate place. He needed some time alone, probably to talk to his father. He was human, after all. He was exhausted all day long, all night with people, broken people, hurting people, sick people. They all needed something from Jesus, and the people kept coming. They tried to get him to stay, but his message to them was this. Listen, my purpose is to preach the good news of God's kingdom. The world as it is today is not all there is. There is a kingdom that is good and perfect where all things are right. And my purpose or my mission is to preach the good news of that kingdom so that you can be a part of my Father's kingdom in all its glory. The physical healing was never Jesus' primary purpose. His primary purpose is so that we could know God's kingdom. For this reason I am sent, he says, to preach God's kingdom. Jesus came to this world not to just temporarily heal people of sickness and disease, but he came to this earth to die as payment for our sin so that we could spend eternity with him in our new and resurrected bodies, in this new earth with its new heavens, all things made right, all things healed once and for all. He rose from the dead and he defeated death for us so that even death doesn't hold power or authority over Jesus. And by extension, anyone whose hope lies in him, death holds no power over them either. If we are indeed his, and if we believe that his death and resurrection were the forgiveness of our sin for our rebellion against God, this earthly death just becomes a doorway from this world to the next. And if we are with Jesus, we will one day get to experience a bodily resurrection as he had with our new and perfect bodies in this new and perfect world that he is coming back to make right and good and new for us. We will get to be in paradise with Jesus. Jesus had the power and authority and they were on display for people to see when he lived on this earth so that we might believe that he was sent from his father and by his death and resurrection, we might have hope that there is something better than what we see in this broken world today. His power and authority 
were on display so that what he said about our future as his children, ruling and reigning in his glorious kingdom, would be believed and looked forward to. So we can look forward to this kingdom. God's kingdom, which is here now in some sense in God's people, and, but in, in a sense, not yet as it one day will be. Jesus defeated Satan, sin, and death on the cross. And one day, they will all be banished for good. New heavens, new earth, new and resurrected bodies. This is our reality that we have to look forward to. Not because we in any way deserved it. We are sinners. Saved by grace, broken people, just like all the broken people of Capernaum. We all deserve death. We deserve destruction. We deserve punishment for our rebellion against God. But Jesus, he came to earth, performed miracles, healed people as a small picture of the much larger and more permanent miracle of physical and spiritual healing and restoration for all those who repent of their sin and believe in this powerful, miraculous authority, Jesus Christ. It is in this good news that we can find joy and hope while we live out our lives here in this world. We need not fear anything as a child of God. Jesus has shown that he has the authority and the power over everything. Satan, demons, sickness, even death has no power over Jesus. This is good news for his children. And so if we are indeed his, let's remind ourselves of this reality as we live our lives this week. If you're not his, consider who Jesus is. Consider why he came and ask him to reveal himself to you through his word, through the people around you, through his church, so that you too can believe and receive this great gift that he offers to those who are his. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending him with all power and authority to give life to those who believe in you, who have faith in Jesus, who repent of sin and place their hope in you. This is good news for the human race, and I pray that we don't allow the greatness of this news to somehow just get uh, suppressed in our lives. I pray that it affects everything we do, and it motivates us to proclaim this good news to all of those who are around us. I pray that we never minimize what you've accomplished for us by living a perfect life, and by your death, and by your resurrection, and by your ascension. I, I just pray that it looms large in our thoughts and our minds and causes us to just love you and worship you for all you have done for us. And I just want to pray this in your name today. Amen.